Hello, good afternoon. You're watching Media Live from the News Hub. I am Portia Gabo. Coming up, the headlines. Government mounts strong defense for deporting Chinese Galamseya Aisha Wan. Contractor on Saglemi Affordable Housing Project reveals only 1,402 housing units were awarded them at a cost of $200 million. Coming up in international news, Mozambique on red alert for Cyclone Kenneth. In our very first story, the Minister of Works and Housing, Samuel Atachia, has accused the previous NDC administration of shortchanging Ghanaians by over 300 housing units on the Saglemi Affordable Housing Project. And taking his turn at the Meet the Press series in Accra, he said the 5,000 housing units pegged at $200 million was reviewed downwards without parliamentary approval. A report by Gottfried Tanam. The Works and Housing Minister Samuel Atachia said his predecessor Collins Dada failed to exhaust laid down procedure by scaling down the number of housing units. Tura OS Ghana Limited to define the number of houses to be constructed, that is 1,502 housing units. The price of the contract sum remained the same, 200 million United States dollars. And this was a time of um, the minister called Honorable Collins Dauda. These are cold facts. So while we have parliament approving, parliamentary approval of 200 million United States dollars and the rollout of 5,000 housing units, the minister together with the company reduced the housing units to 1,502. The minority in parliament has been mounting pressure on government to release the completed housing units for habitation to address the country's housing deficit. But the sector minister insisted the ministry will not take any steps to give out the houses to Ghanaians since the investigations are ongoing to establish what he said bordered on criminality. When we have the advice, we have our view as a ministry but we have to defer to the Constitution and let the Attorney General advise. When we receive the advice, we know what to do. And very soon, certain things are in the background. There are a lot of investors who want to come and continue the projects. But they can't continue until the projects are properly, I mean, assessed, what has been done, and then the legalities are in place for the contract to be terminated. He put the blame largely on the Brazilian construction firm for under-delivering even though more than 99% of the funds were released to them. There is no denier the fact that the contractor, having received an amount of 179904757.78 million United States dollars out of 1810189 representing 99.39% should have delivered pro rata almost all the housing units, including the on site infrastructure. The contractor has misappropriated the sum of 1298985164.80 million. United States dollars. In 2016, former President John Mahama commissioned the first phase of the project to complete 1,500 of the 5,000 housing units. A number of the houses are to be sold at subsidized rates for low income earners. The project was expected to be a complete city with industrial and recreational facilities, schools, shopping malls, and other social amenities. The Saglemi housing unit was supposed to reduce the housing deficit in the country and under phase one 
of the project. It was comprising 1,502 two housing units and this one to three bedroom apartment was at a cost of 200 million dollars now 645 housing units have been completed but they currently have no electricity and no water and 99.1 of the money has been paid to contractors however the minister of works and housing is saying that 129 million dollars has been misappropriated in the contract and currently government owes um, constructora oas Ghana Limited, 2.6% of the cost of the project in taxed refunds and the houses were to be subsidized at 40%. And joining us in the studio to throw more light on the issue is Ben Arthur. He is a civil engineer as well as Adam Senanu, an anti-corruption campaign. And gentlemen, you're welcome to Media Live on TV3. Let Thank me you. first begin with you, Mr. Arthur. Now, yeah. the contractor at the center of the controversy that OAS Contractura has confirmed to us just before we came on air that they were awarded 1,402 housing units out of the 5,000 units for the, at a cost of $200 million. Now, um, going, if we go by this calculation, it means that a unit could sell at $133,333. And that's way higher than the prevailing market price by SNIT at $17,000. Is this not abnormally high? Well, thank you and uh, good afternoon to our viewers and my people at Asanto Mampo who are watching. It's an interesting thing that we're witnessing in this country. We talk about affordable housing, but in my purview and from my experience, the figures that we're churning out, the 135 for me, exceeds the limit of what we call affordability. But you see, we have a lot of subjectivity surrounding housing. Mm. When you talk about a uh, house per square meter or floor per square meter, it depends on the finishes. So it is very difficult to just sit here and say that this house is too expensive, this house is not expensive, and the rest. But once we give a criteria of, of affordability, then I can conclude that the 135 which uh, culminates in many thousands of Ghana cities oh. uh, is not going to be affordable to the ordinary Ghanaian. Of course, if you're building a house in Accra, as opposed to building it in Wa, you realize that there are elements of it that makes the big difference. We can also argue from the point of view of external works, which usually we do not consider. If I'm building a housing unit in an area where I'm supposed to provide uh, electricity, the grid, not just to the house, but the grid itself. I'm supposed to construct network of uh, drains and uh, roads and the rest. It will make the cost of the building excessively mm. high because it has come with the other infrastructure. But if private individuals are doing it, oftentimes they can scatter it and the roads are not the well-engineered ones. You just get some passage and that is all right. So all these things come in and then we can also talk about price fluctuation. Uh, our market, especially when it comes to materials and the rest, we don't produce many of the materials we use here for building, especially finishes in this country. So when we have uh, an economic climate that you know, has changing prices, obviously you leave a price there for about a year, and after a year you realize that the change is significant. So would you so say there was we no need value to avail, for money in this uh, deal? I will not be able to be conclusive because I don't have all the facts you know, in front of me here. So I, I cannot draw that conclusion okay. professionally okay. unless I have looked at the design, looked at the pricing, you know, the rates and the rest. Uh, Mr. Sananu, the Minister of Works and Housing is saying that the state was shortchanged in this deal. It's been fraught with corruption. Then. He's saying that over $100 million has been misappropriated. We are talking of prosecution here. Hasn't this delayed? It has delayed. I, I was really dumbfounded and intrigued mm -hmm. that two years later, I mean, considering that our transition was by 2017, first quarter, he must have been appointed. This is at least one and a half years too late. Especially if we started out with 5,000 housing units put before parliament. 
And then they say the contract was renegotiated for 1,500. How did we move from 5,000 to 1,500? For a project as big as 5,000 housing units, that's a mega project. There's no way a minister coming into office would not have put his scrutiny on that particular project to the extent that you begin to discover that in spite of the 5,000, they are now saying 1,500. And on the ground, you have about 600. That should have raised red flags. It's way, I mean, at this point, the minister shouldn't be calling a press conference to tell us we are consulting the attorney general. He has questions to answer himself. At this point, we should be told that the former minister, the technocrats, the contractor have been hauled, they've been questioned, this is where we are, this is the money being retrieved. Not to tell us that $129 million of our money has been misappropriated. It's late in the day. Now, the minister is thinking about no. terminating the contract. Is this it doesn't make sense. <laughs> At this stage, when you've paid... If, if I can come in, uh, when you talk about termination of contract and then uh, judgment debt, then you want to balance. But obviously, if a contractor has uh, misappropriated the money, it is enough grounds, usually in government contract, it is enough grounds for termination of contract. And if I may add my voice to this... Uh, uh, I do not intend to insult contractors, but I believe that sometimes people connive with the consultants mm. and they take unnecessary monies from state. And once this has come to light, I think that the minister ought to put his feet down, save the public purse, save us and our examples. My question is, if we had given these opportunities to Ghanaians, are we not able to do all these constructions? Mm. We, are, we are more than capable. So maybe going forward, we have to look inward and see how best our Ghanaian, you know, estate developers and the rest can take advantage of this. Mm. Sorry uh, for the interruption. Mr. he was talking mm. about protecting the public purse. Yes. Should we terminate the contract or renegotiate with the contractor to complete the housing? I, I, I think it's late in the day mm. to talk about termination. 99.1 <laughs> something something percent paid to him. I mean, <laughs> uh, the termination doesn't really afford us. I think what we would like to focus on is prosecution and retrieval. Mm. Because obviously something has been inflated. By whatever maths you can conjure this, mm -hmm. if what you put before Parliament had 5,000, unless the facts are, are different from what we are hearing, if what was put before Parliament had 5,000, mm. and then they had to sit down to renegotiate 2,500, and by the way, we're talking affordable, whatever you do, the maths doesn't work out. There are questions to be mm -hmm. answered, and we want the money back. I, I think that it's late in the day, and this is one opportunity that the minister has to set a right example. Ghanaians, we don't want a new normal where it's like we just talk about it and okay, so nobody got to jail. So we also, we are not in power and find something about us. Uh, don't do anything about it. Pat my back, I pat your back. We want to see serious action. It's, it's not enough for him to come and say $129 million misappropriated. It's, it's, it does not serve any, any purpose. No. Mr. Afa, Greta yeah. is saying that they would have been able to construct this housing facility for $60 million. By this calculation, do you agree with it? Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's possible, especially by our local men. But there's one thing that I think that they must also understand, that our people hold little capital. And because of that, they are unable to assert themselves that much. So. Possibly, if they put themselves together the way they have done, they can approach government, you know, to, to, to attract some of these opportunities. But going back to my brother's issue, uh, if you have a contract, especially in the construction field, and the contractor in quote and unquote is seen allegedly to have misbehaved in terms of performance, because you definitely issue performance bonds. You know, so if you go into this detail, you issue a performance bond. And not only that, if there is any advance given to any contractor whatsoever, it is public practice, procurement practice, that you ought to take also advance mobilization, uh, more or less, insurance. It can be from an insurance company or it can be from a bank. So if you default, then it is unconditional. Government can go to the issuers and then claim it. If you don't perform, once there's a performance bond, government can call upon the performance bond, the guarantee in, in, in this case. So once the minister is alleging all these things, I'm also averting his mind to the fact that 
he ought to scrutinize the bond that has Absolutely. been issued and call on it. Absolutely. Immediately. Absolutely. That is what will make a contractor say that because once you call on the bond, the issuers of the bond will also come and attack your property, your equipment, and the rest. Then it will put pressure on the contractor to perform or to bring back the monies that have been taken wrongfully. And I mean, honestly speaking, I think there are many more questions than even yeah. this. One wants to find out that that bond was made and it's sitting there. And it's not an issue of, again, it was a government-engineered thing so that they are between the devil and deep blue sea because we are, we, are, we are known to do very strange things. Beyond that, how can you have a situation where Greta is saying that we could do this for $60 million, and yet, in terms of the procurement process, we ended up with an, uh, an external group saying they're going to do it for $200 million at 5000 and then we go back and negotiate it. Now, Mr. Stenon, before you go, the man at the center of this whole controversy, mm. the former Minister of Works and Housing, mm. Collins Dauda, is yet to respond to these corruption allegations. How urgent is his response to this? Oh, like yesterday. I mean, if, if, if uh, this is something that has been brewing for a while. If there were people who were upfront about this, at least would, we, he should have come out to say, look, this is ac exactly what transpired. It's late in the day. We are expecting all the key people who were involved in this process to speak up and let us know what has transpired. In any case, we are expecting that the government of Ghana, especially the minister, takes actions that are necessary now, urgent ones, to retrieve whichever sums, using whichever mechanisms are available to us as a people. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for your time. I've been speaking to Ben Arthur. He is a civil engineer as well as Adam Sinano. He is an anti-corruption campaigner. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're still watching Media Live from the News <laughs> Hub. In another development, the Lands and Natural Resources Minister Kweku Asuma Trema has mounted a strong defense on government's decision to deport the Chinese national Aisha Wan, who was involved in illegal mining, popularly known as Galamsi. At a news conference in Accra, the sector minister insisted Government did not exchange her for the two million dollar Sino Hydro deal. With respect to the 194 foreigners that have been deported, the exact figures dealing with them as per particular nationals cannot be given now. But the nationals that have been deported include Chinese, Indians, Nigerians, Malians and Burkinabis. So it is not only Chinese that have been deported. Neither is it only Aisha Wan that has been deported for purposes of Sino-Hydro loan or purposes of Sino-Hydro agreement that the government of Ghana has with the Chinese government. And we did not sacrifice her or exchange her for the loan. This lady was in Ghana prior to the arrangement that we made with the Chinese government to secure the financial assistance from them. And no government official thought of shielding her. No government official pampered her. There is nobody in the MPP that dreamt of dealing with Aisha in one way or the other so that she can perpetrate the illegal mining she was found in doing in Ghana so as to enable Ghana to secure the loan from Chinese government. League Selom Amenya was at the press briefing and joins me here in the studio. Selom, what else did the minister say on Aisha Wan? Well, the, the minister was saying that when it comes to cases in court, it is the AG that is clothed with the power to either continue or discontinue the matter. And once the AG felt that uh, there wasn't the need to continue, but it was better to uh, deport her, government did not have a say in that particular matter. And he also argued that over 194 nationals have been deported. It's not Aisha Juan alone. Mm -hmm. And currently, there are others also standing trial in courts around the Ashanti region of Boasi and also Takwa and the rest. Mm -hmm. So it cannot be said, it is unwarranted for the NDC to mm -hmm. say or anybody to suggest that uh, Aisha Wan was actually deported in exchange for the sign of Hydro. So he did react to the NDC press briefing? Yes, he reacted to the NDC press briefing. You remember on Tuesday, the NDC said that the fight against Galamse has failed and uh, it was on the brink of uh, uh, collapse. But uh, what the minister is saying that the 
fight against Galamsey has been successful, though a visit to some places will show that the water is currently returning back to the bad state it was in. He attributed that to the fact that the rains have started washing the banks of the river back into it. And also, he alluded to the fact that though there are some people still engaging in illegal mining in some forests and other places in the country, the uh, Operation Vanga, the team that has been assigned to deal with that, will continue to not relent in its efforts. What were some of the issues that came up with the Interministerial Committee on Illegal Mining? All right. Questions were raised about uh, what was being done to those who were captured in the uh, Anas uh, Galamse fraud video. And he said that it is premature for him to make comments on that particular matter because uh, the man who was actually uh, at the helm of affairs, Charles Bisu, is under investigations and he resigned voluntarily from the committee. So it was premature for him to say anything. Some people and organizations are calling for the overhauling of the entire interministerial committee. But he is of the view that it was out of the wisdom of the president that he created that uh, committee. He felt that the tax was enormous. So there was the need to get an, a, a committee to see to it. And he feels that the committee has done a lot of things uh, significantly. So they should be allowed to work. Thank you very much, Salom Amenya. We have details of this particular press briefing on News 360. You're still watching Midday Live from the News Hub. The new patriotic party has inaugurated an 11-member committee to run affairs of the party for the next four years. And swearing in the new members, the national chairman of the party, Freddie Blay, charged members to ensure the party stays in power after 2020 elections and beyond. The constitution of the new patriotic party stipulates that after every major election to elect national and regional executives, standing and ad hoc committees of the party be inaugurated to support the efforts of the newly elected executives. The 11 new committees include Constitutional and Legal Committee, Finance Committee, Communications Committee, Vetting Committee, the ICT Committee, Elections Committee and Organizational Committee. The rest are the Welfare and Dispute Resolution Committee, the Disciplinary Committee, Events Committee and Research Committee. Members of the committee comprised government appointees, including Ursula Ousu, Communications Minister, who is now serving as the chair of the ICT Committee, and Kujopo Nkrumah, who is the Information Minister, is also serving as a member of the Communications Committee, amongst others. It's a very different party. It has its own ideology. It has its own character, its own culture. And very resilient and extremely hardworking. And to the extent that it's very independent. And therefore we must continue to, as it were, uphold those values. So that if they start working, we could advise the party, they could advise government, they could advise the president himself, and uh, the leadership of the party itself. It's, it's versatile. The NPP's national chair, Freddie Blay, said the mandate of the committee members goes beyond the 2020 elections. This will help the party to manage its affairs, to organize itself, not only for elections, but as a party. And being that it's not just organizing ourselves, to win elections, yes. Very important that we win elections so that our ideas, and you could hear from what Mr. Elizabeth Ohine did say, that it's a very different party. Fifteen new members were also sworn in and added to the National Council of Elders. Coming up is the MTN video report and today our citizen journalist Hussein Al-Hassan wants government to provide furniture for a primary school at Savalugu in the northern region. This is to our primary school in Savalugu municipality. This is a class two of that school. I'm a parent who just passed by only to realize that our peoples are lying on their stomachs, having their exams. In the class, you can only see two furniture, which is a metal one, of course. And it was made by six parents. So we are pleading on government to come to the school aid so that they will provide them with furniture.
to have a better education. This is a citizen journalist from Savalugu municipality, Fiseni Alassan. You can also send your video reports via WhatsApp on the number 055-143-3044. You're still watching Ready Life from the News Hub. We have more news coming up shortly. Do stay with us. Hello again in business this afternoon. The Chamber of Petroleum Consumers Ghana, COPEC, has reiterated its call for a national dialogue on what it describes as constant fuel price increases. Executive Secretary Duncan Amwa blamed the increase in prices at the local pumps on the pricing formula. The price increases are a result from three main factors, namely price movements on the international market, the performance of the city and taxes. COPEC insists the sector ministry and the National Petroleum Authority have refused to respond to the chamber's numerous requests for a dialogue on the petroleum price build-up. If you talk about it too much, it becomes a political who should have done what, who didn't do what. We believe that the actual challenge is in the pricing formula. Duncan Amoa fears consumers may never get any relief on fuel prices. Yet Ghanaians are being charged over and over and over above their pockets. There's just been an increase. I will not be surprised if there's a further increase even in May because the world market is still looking quite volatile. The US-Iran sanctions and uh, what it means for uh, world market supplies is that prices may inch upwards even in the coming weeks. He insists it is time for the national dialogue. If we cannot control world market prices, when the city becomes a problem, we pay more. When world market goes up, we pay more. When taxes go up, we pay more. I think that the time has come for the Ministry of Energy, the NPA, to take up this challenge that we've thrown to them almost a year now, to at least have a pricing dialogue where we look at the items that together make up how much Ghanaians are paying for. The devil is right in there. I'm sure we'll find a solution some way, somehow. In other business news, the Director of Internal Audit and Evaluation Operations at the ECOWAS Bank for Investment and Development wants AU member states to increase public-private partnership and project evaluation. He was addressing the Africa International Conference on Trade in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. 22 African countries have ratified the Africa Continental Free Trade Area, with 52 out of the 55 member states signing the agreement a year after it was promulgated. Director of Internal Audits and Evaluation Operations at the ECOWAS Bank for Investment and Development, Ulagunji Moses Ashimolowo, says the Free Trade Area Agreement will expand funding opportunities for Africa to add value to raw materials produced on the continent. Assistant Commissioner, Customs Division of the Ghana Revenue Authority, Seidu Yakubo, indicated that the ECOWAS Common External Tariff Regime will enhance the advantages in the agreement for countries in the subregion. Customs will again facilitate trade by allowing goods originating from member states to enter other member states without payment of import duty. Once we say it's a free trade area, but the modalities have to be set clear. As at now, to help the administration, customs administrations in Africa collect the AU levy. The African Economic Outlook 2019 provides evidence of growing cooperation in several areas, lending credence to the need for the Free Trade Area Agreement. The Director General of the Police CIDC, OP Mame Yati Wadudankwa, has charged accountants to see their work as one that can reduce institutional corruption in the country. She tasked them to move away from the expression of opinions, but rather be sequential and specific in their reports for prosecution. George Quinn reports. The accountancy profession has been under the spotlight. Public expectation, trust and confidence have waned in recent times as ethics by some professionals have been questioned. 
the ISAC ACCA roundtable meeting brought together key stakeholders who acknowledged that technology is the surest means to advance the operations. CEO of the Institute of Chartered Accountants Ghana, Paul Kwesiadjman, refuted claims that occupational corruption stems from inefficiencies of accountants. We have a responsibility of safeguarding the assets and investments of investors. The worst we can do to investor is to help the investor to earn adequate return on the investments, not to collapse the investment. The Director General of the Police CID, COP Mameya Tewadudankwa, challenged practitioners to be specific in their reports for prosecution. For the purpose of the auditing, you need to show how the money got out, how the money got into the pay, how did it happen. So you need to look at all the trail to support policy. Because at the end of the day, when you put the person before court, you are supposed to convince the judge that all these things happened, and that is why you'll be saying the person has committed an offense of A or B. Director of the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants Africa urged practitioners to be proactive and anticipate future challenges and develop solutions to address them ahead of time. If we are expected to be at the forefront of advising our clients, our employers, and indeed uh, our own businesses as driving our businesses forward, then we need to adapt and be able to drive the change as being part of those making the change happen rather than change happening to us. Meanwhile, the Institute of Chartered Accountants Ghana has reviewed the examination syllabi to reflect the changing dynamics in the global market and profession. The Institute of Chartered Accountants Ghana and Association of Chartered Certified Accountants Roundtable Meeting was on a theme, the future of accountancy in Ghana. That's it for business news. For more news, log on to our website at 3news.com. We have more news coming up shortly. To stay with us. And coming up in this segment, award-winning playwright Latif Abubakar will be making his 10th year of producing thought-provoking plays with yet another masterpiece dubbed Christmas in April. Exciting play by Latif Abubakar. Award-winning playwright Latif Abubakar will be marking his 10th year of producing thought-provoking plays with yet another masterpiece dubbed Christmas in April. He has a track record of thrilling and at the same time educating theater lovers with his humor-packed plays. The famous playwright and chief executive officer of Globe Production has shown consistency in promoting social change through drama. He boasts of several thought-provoking and family-oriented plays. Produced in 2017, his play Judas and Delilah puts the focus on HIV-AIDS and its prevention. He partnered the National Road Safety Commission to produce Men Don't Die, a stage play to promote road safety. Saints and Sinners updated Ghanaians on effects of Galamse. <laughs> you see, all this, your activations, is spoiling the water bodies. Na, na, koko. If the people want water, we shall give them a uh, package water or, or pure water. What are you talking? I Can't Think Far called for an end to election violence and threw the spotlight on anger management. <laughs> The list is endless. Theatre lovers are in for yet another thrilling weekend as the CEO of Globe Productions, Latif Abubakar, gears up for his much-anticipated play Christmas in April. The play to mark Globe Production 10th anniversary will take place at the Accra International Conference Center on 27th and 28th April 2019. Christmas in April is Latif Abubakar's 13th play. And the playwright himself is here with me in the studio. Good afternoon, Latif, and thanks for joining us. Yeah, so afternoon. it's been 10 years of not just exciting Ghanaians, but making positive impact. What's the secret? Um, I, I think that uh, for our brand, we actually looking at theatre for development. So it's more about how we can contribute to the development of the nation. Mm. So that's how come it's not just about the entertainment and the comedy, but we do plays that educate people. Some of your plays have featured inspiring themes such as Galamse and yeah. road safety. 
What inspires your choice of theme? Um, I think that for we also look at what are the current trends, what are the issues affecting Ghanaians, the current issues affecting Ghanaians, and then we try to play our role using theater to educate yeah. people on the positives and the negatives of whatever issue is happening. So if you look at the issues of Galamse, we partnered with the Media Coalition mm -hmm. and TV32 to, to execute something for not just people in Accra, but mm -hmm. we, we, we educated people across the Galamse area. So we went to Takwa, we went to Obuase, we went to the north, mm -hmm. because Galamse is actually happening in the north to the surprise of a lot of people, just to meet the people, the, ta the people of the town and the chiefs to educate them about the negative effects of their activities on the environment. Uh, have you seen any positive impact as a result of the drama I, I, this stage? I, I think that one of the interesting things about drama is that it's able to pull when, uh, if you ask a lot of stakeholders, when you, you, you just want to go and organize seminars to talk to people, it's so difficult attracting mm. them to come over to educate them. But when you put it in the form of drama, they see it as more of entertainment and something exciting. And they come in their numbers. So we, you get a full house to be able to send out the kind of information you want to send so it's it's really impactful it's very useful to for communication 10 years in the industry what are your setbacks ah, challenges is more about i think it's about um, financing mm. and then um, I, I think that's that's basically because we have the talents we have the technical know-how but usually it's difficult to finance mm. stage uh, stage plays um, you need about eighty thousand to hundred thousand to be able to produce one play so if you don't have sponsors and backends or if you don't brand it well you don't have people like tv3 to yeah. support you you yeah. won't be able to make it happen all right now let's talk about your latest play christmas in april how can christmas be in april <laughs> <laughs> um, it's our 10th year mm. and uh, it comes with a lot of surprises um, so we had to invite santa not to come in december but to come actually in mm. april fortunately for us santa has arrived and uh we just want to put smiles on, on the faces of people. We want to make people happy. We want people to have an experience they've never had before. That is why we are having Christmas in mm. April, because people usually celebrate Christmas during, uh, I mean, the season, the December season. But this time around, there's something, going to, there's something special going to What's happen. What's that special thing? Tell us. I, 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 <laughs> we, one of the things uh, we agreed with Santa is not to really... Uh, bring out you know normally with our place we talk about what is going to happen the details the only guarantee i can give you is comedy mm -hmm. that you will laugh out loud mm -hmm. but as to the surprises i mean the the experience begins from the foyer of the conference center not just the play you're going to watch there's there's a whole lot of experience at the foyer even with santa even before you enter into the main auditorium to watch the exact play mm -hmm. so what i can talk about or the gist i can give you is that it's on modern day slavery okay well, yeah, but are you featuring yourself? You've been <laughs> staging plays for 10 years now. We've never seen you in a play. Uh, oh, don't worry. My time will come. <laughs> so my time will come. This time we have a course, Metasante, General and Tatia, and um, we have uh, Fixing Solomon Ogu, Bright Jankman, serious play, um, I mean, stage play actors. And uh, my audience and people who have watched our plays could testify that we are one of the best in Ghana. When and is this coming on? On the 27th and 28th of April at the at Accra International Conference Center, we do two shows each day. Right. We have the 4 p.m. show and then the 8 p.m. show. That's Thank you very much for your time. You're and I've welcome. been speaking to Latif Abubakar. He is a playwright. You're still watching Middle Live from the News Hub. For more news, you can log on to our website at 3news.com. And also visit us on social media, facebook.com slash tv3ghana, twitter.com slash tv3ghana. And that's it for Mede Life. Thanks so much for watching. I am Portia Gabo. And that's it for Mede Life. Thanks so much for watching. I am Portia Gabo. Enjoy the rest of our programs. Good afternoon.